Thank you for listening to the Speaking Out on Sex Abuse podcast with hosts Clara and Jimmy Hinton. If you're new to the podcast, please subscribe and share so you never miss an episode. Android users can find us and subscribe on your Play Music app. Apple users can find us and subscribe on Apple Podcasts. You can find us on Stitcher. You can follow us on Spreaker. And you can find the podcast on jimmyhinton.org and findingahealingplace.com. Please rate our show, subscribe, and share so that we can spread the word. Let's get into the show. Welcome to the Speaking Out on Sex Abuse podcast here with host Jimmy Hinton. And Jimmy's mom, Clara. And from somebody down under, Eric Peterson. Eric, say hello. Hello. (laughs) Wow. Hey, hey, Jimmy. Hey, Clara. How are you? Hello. Excellent, man. It is uh, is our honor to have you on our show today. Uh, Eric, Eric and I connected... Oh, uh, how long ago was that? Probably a year ago, maybe, maybe not even. It could be less. Yeah. So Eric, um, Eric has a powerful story. Eric is an abuse survivor, and uh, we share a lot about abuse, and uh, just have a lot of mutual friends and and connections. And you realize pretty quickly how small the world is. And uh, I just I I appreciate Eric and and his fight for justice and. Uh, And that he's very sarcastic because we live in the North (laughs) and uh, I lived in Arkansas for 10 years where they just didn't get sarcasm, Um, at least not like they do up here. So uh, we are very sarcastic. A lot of Americans just don't seem to have a sense of humor. (laughs) (laughs) They make comedy movies, but they don't laugh at them or something. Is that how it works? (laughs) Something like that. (laughs) Shame. That's a shame because there's a lot of healing in humor. Yeah, there definitely is. It really is. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, we were just talking about how our, you know, your sense of humor gets pretty twisted when you do all the abuse stuff. And I found that over, probably over the, over the last five years, um, my humor has just gone to the gutter. And uh, <laughs> I, bad I, bio just gotten really bad. <laughs> And I just laugh at things that I never thought I would laugh at, which uh, which is a good thing, because it, it is uh, laughter is a very good medicine. If you didn't laugh, you'd cry in this yes. sort of a area, wouldn't you? Yes. So yeah. uh, I don't want to take up a whole lot of your time because I want you to have plenty of time to tell your story. So I'll just let you jump in and uh, give some of the background and and uh, talk about why you're so passionate about uh, fighting abuse. Yeah, sure. Um, well, it, it started to go pear shaped for me as a young fella. Um, I travelled. My father was Norwegian, and so I lived in Norway for a while. And the age of about seven was when I came across my first stash of porn. And as a seven-year-old kid, looking at stuff like that, it causes problems. Um, even as an early age. I, I look back now and, and things that mum and dad have told me in the past where I disconnected at about eight, age of nine. It was about 10 when I started to lash out at mum. I didn't know what was going on. I was just a young, confused fella that had seen stuff that should not, just should not, you know. It um, it really did affect me and, and what happened in the situation that made it worse was that the girl that I was with at the time, it was her older brother's stash, we then tried to reenact what we were looking at in the books. Wow. And um, That messes you up as a kid, man. That's just not the way to go. Well, I've heard mom describe it as, um, you know, you, you talked about uh, – sunrises and, and sunsets are things that we see every day and they're and they really are uh just divine they are absolutely just so powerful and 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 are so much a part of god's creation and they're you know there's this um mystical side of it because they're just so beautiful and breathtaking and she said but you know we see them day in and day out and we don't think twice about it because it's just Part of, part of nature. Yeah, part you expect of, it. Right, and she right, said, but yeah. uh, anybody who survived a tornado or a hurricane or a, a, just a tremendous storm, 
uh, that becomes imprinted on your memory forever. It's something that you will never forget. Um, you know, if you ask somebody when the last, what the last sunrise looked like that they remember, they probably can't describe it, but ask somebody, yeah. you know, the last tornado or hurricane or, um, cyclone, uh, cause you know, you're upside down down there in Australia. Uh, you know, when, when, when is the last time that you remember living through one of those? Everybody can describe every detail of it because it's yeah, traumatic. That, that, they do. It's amazing that. And it, and it seems to be what I find interesting is it's years later that the details start to become clearer and clearer. Hmm. Yeah. And that's the bad stuff because that's when you're a grown-up and you've got to cope with living in this crappy world to start with and then all of a sudden all these memories start coming up. You start having nightmares and, yeah, it's not nice. Yeah. It's definitely not nice to go through that. So I pretty much meandered on through life after that, you know. Didn't get into too much trouble at school. And then at around about the age of 13, I had a neighbour who was a scoutmaster. And everybody's going, whoa, yep, and that's exactly what happened. I became one of his victims. Um, that fella at the moment, all the information has been put forward through to the police. And I'm hoping he will get it really good visit this time um the gentleman that was my assailant he only copped a few years when he got busted last time and he'd been operational in the scouts since 1978 till approximately 2002 hmm. so he's hoping you know and, and that that was the thing that messed me up you know the guy lured me in with porn and that seems to be one of the key things a lot of these predators use on young kids, especially males, is pornography to get the old teenage hormones going. And, you know, you've got a young teenager that don't know what's going on. He's like a bull with no brains. He's just, yeah, you know, at the, at the beck and call of the predator, basically. You, you're like a puppet. That's how I, um, when I look back now, I feel like you're a puppet in a, um, in a show. And so... That messed me up. I didn't um, – I think it happened two or three times. Um, With the uh, the guy I, who was a scoutmaster. Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't – seriously, I, I don't know why I kept going back. And it wasn't until he asked me to start doing pictures. He said, you know, I could make $50 a photo, no headshots, so nobody would ever know who it was. Was I interested? And that's when I freaked out and thought, you're one sick puppy. Wow. I got a problem, you know. And so I, I didn't tell anybody. I just carried on and bottled that with the rest of the stuff. Then um, it wasn't that long after that I got asked to go to a local church. And I thought, mm, why not? There wasn't much else that I hadn't sort of been to in my life. My father had always told me growing up that, if you ever needed protection or sanctuary, the church is the place to go. You know, see, Dad was brought up in Norway in the, what, 1920s, 30s, 40s, and church was a lot different back then. It was a place of sanctuary and refuge. Hmm. Um, now, sadly, it seems to be a place for predators and groomers. You know, so That's very true. Yeah, I mean, I just wrote a blog post the other day. I, I think you read it, and... Uh... You know, here are three churches that I that I'm directly involved in, and uh, they're just actively covering up abusers. And as I wrote that blog post, uh, the messages are just pouring in from people from those congregations saying, "Yeah, we we experienced the same thing at this church, but with a different abuser." And I'm shocked Man. at the number of messages just from those yeah. churches. It's sad to hear, but it is good to that they actually come forward. You know, um, yeah, I don't know what it is that caused me to be quiet for so long but um i think it took 36 years till i actually came forward um i don't know whether it was shame guilt um not sure yeah so uh, it was it was interesting you know so i went to this local church i thought why not and um <laughs> As they say in the old penny days, mate, praise be to God, the pastor at the time um, was helping me deal with the Scoutmaster stuff. He was an absolute blessing. 
But sadly, at the same time, there was an issue going on in that church where there was some ladies grooming us kids, us boys. Hmm. Um, I look back now and they treated us like Ken dolls, mate. Uh, one of them was a fashion designer and she was giving us all these fancy clothes to wear. And I look back now and I, I know why she wanted us wearing those tight jeans. You know, they were sussing us out and getting their thrills. Wow. And um, eventually what happened was that um, you get to be the last person dropped off after youth group and all of a sudden it all comes. Um, you, you just – everything just sort of happens all at once and next minute you're in bed with a woman. Hmm. And it's like, wow. Um, that happened once and then I pretty much got palmed off onto a friend of hers They'd used me like a, a toy. They'd um, show us porn and things like that, again, to get us all charged up, and then they'd take advantage of us. Um, sadly, too, at the same time, there was a youth leader that was in that church that we were all concerned about that was always around the boys. Well, he did tag one of those fellas in that youth group, one of the boys I used to go to school with. And the rotten dogs that were in charge of that church let him resign and move into state with his boyfriend where he now resides. And, um, you know, that that's just crook, mate. It is. But it it's disgusting. It doesn't stop there. It doesn't stop there. Um, one of the other fellas that I found out that I used to share a car with and play soccer with raped another friend of mine at that church. She was not even 16 at that age, at that stage, sorry. And... Um, she told her father, who was an elder at the church, what had happened to her. She'd expressed also to him what she believed was happening to us boys and also about the gentleman that was um, grooming boys, and he did nothing. Um, sadly, at the time, I found out he was beaten up on his wife and beaten up on his kids and sleeping with any skirt that would look his way. Hmm. So he wasn't going to call that out because he himself would have come under scrutiny too. You know, and the sad thing yeah, about all that, looking back you now, the thing that breaks my heart is too, is that those elders in that room, they were privy to what was going on and they just let it all go under the carpet. Well, you that's know? the thing that I wrote about in this in this last post. I said, you know, at, at, at first, you know, when you first start doing this, you think, <coughs> are, uh, are, they, are they really, you know, are they really aware of what's going on or are they just ignorant? You know, is it is it a fa is it a matter of they just don't know or you know because a lot of this stuff is done in secrecy um, or do yep. they know the facts and 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 the more I do this and the more I talk to people, not only did they know they you know it, in many cases they have victims uh, meet with the elders and give every detail of what happened to them. They have them write letters. They know every single yep. dark detail, and they still do nothing to help the victims. It's it's ludicrous. I don't um, get I it. Don't, I don't understand it. Me neither. Um, I'm like you. If anything like that or this happened, mate, I'm straight to the cops. Yeah, yeah. You know, the last right. church that I was in here where I'm living at the moment, um, one of the fellows in the church – you know, got to hear a bit about my life. I think it might have been on a podcast or something. I don't know how. And he comes up to me and starts telling me about a family that had been raping him in the church for years when he was a young fella. Wow. Um, didn't didn't blink, mate. I just looked at him in the eye and I said, if you're going to continue to this, we will be going to the police. Yeah. And he looked at me and continued. So um, straight to the coppers as soon as we got a chance. And he got to tell the police what those mongrels did to him as a kid. Hmm. You know, it, it's rife. I'm surprised that that was never picked up. Um, I was always concerned about that family. We'd only been in the church about eight years, but I already knew there was just something wrong about it. And then when that young fella come out and told me that, it was like, holy dooly. He, it was just, it was unbelievable. But it was good for him. He got to, people aren't listening, Jimmy. I think that's yeah. one of the biggest Problems is they go, oh, yeah, just another sex report. Oh, yeah, yeah, just another person chasing glory. Oh, yeah, just somebody with 
you know, an issue to cause, disgruntled, oh, they're unforgiving, they're not. No, the fact is this stuff happens and people, they should they should be free to be able to talk to anybody about it in the church, especially the elders. Yes. You know? Yes. Well, um, and the, you know, that, the other phenomenon too that, that I find is everybody yells at, at, at the TV. You know, when they see abusers on TV, it's, oh my goodness, how terrible and isn't that awful? They should rot in hell. They should go to prison and all these different things. And then, and then when it's in their church, all of a sudden, well, you know, this person who's <laughs> disclosing has a troubled past. Um, they made a mistake. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Or they, you know, the 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 person uh, made a mistake. They just messed uh, up, and you need to forgive and move on. But yeah, I mean, everybody everybody can shout at a TV. Um, but when when you have to make it a hard decision to report it to the police, um, or just to do something, anything, to sit and listen to a victim, all of a sudden, it, it, it's like they lose their ever loving minds in the church. I did. Um, I know when I gave my statements to the police, it was like a monkey was taken off my back. It was amazing. It reminded me of Pilgrim's Progress, you know, where yeah. he's going up a narrow path and his burden falls off. Um, yeah, the pendulum's slowly swinging back, but let me tell you, I felt like Superman since I did that. It was amazing. Yeah. Um, all those years, that, that thing just hangs over you, you know. And, um, but yeah, see, even in that church that I was talking about, mate, they knew something was going on with me because, um, right in the middle of all this, I actually got the left foot of fellowship, I call it. Hmm. And, um, I was asked to leave. I think I was about 15. And the pastor that had to tell me the good news was in tears because he had walked me through the issues with that scoutmaster problem yet had no idea what was going on in the church itself. Unbelievable. Absolutely unbelievable. The coppers have all that. Um, There's no runner now. They've got the details of everything. So so you went all the way to the Royal Commission? Uh, Yes. I contacted them, and I can't remember when it happened. I think it may have been not long after I first heard Kerry Ferguson's testimony with um, Chris Roseborough back in, I think they recorded in 2015 of the abuse that she went through in a C3 church here in Australia. Yeah. That kind of motivated me. Um, It stirred something in me because I've always been a bit psycho when it comes to protecting kids and girls in the church. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Let's just say I've had a few conversations with fellas behind closed doors who didn't come back to the church once I <laughs> explained to them why they were really there and they agreed, you know. Um, I think it possibly could be a thing that happens, you know, when you've suffered this kind of stuff. You tend to become very protective of people. Yes. You know. Well, and, and that's um, what drives me crazy about people. I, I just had somebody ask at the last place that I spoke at, I did a full day training and, and, uh, you know, this man asked me what I thought about, uh, victims who turn around and, and start abusing people because they were victimized. And he said, how do you respond to that? And I said, well, first of all, I think it, I said, quite frankly, I think it really sucks that that's the perception when that's not the reality. Now, sure. Yep. Some, some, some do. I mean, it's, it's about, 20%, maybe a little bit less than that, of people who've uh, been victimized themselves um, turn around and abuse others. And oftentimes that's adolescents who they experiment and do things like that. Yeah. Um, they don't go on to become stupid. abusers. Um, no. So, you know, I, I I explained that to him and I said, what really stinks is for, especially for male victims, when they know that that's the perception out there, that people are thinking that if they've uh, if they've been abused, then all of a sudden they're going to start abusing kids. Of yep. course they don't speak up. Of course they're not going to tell people. They're terrified to tell people. And so you know, I just kind of explained this to this to this gentleman, and he just I, I saw this big sigh of relief, and he says, "Well, he said I'm a survivor of abuse," and he oh, said, "I you. he said I can't." Thank you enough for saying that because he said it is terrifying to tell people. 
And here he had been living with that his whole life, you know? Yeah, it's so wrong. It's so wrong, that stigma that people have put on victims and survivors um, that they feel that they can't talk out because maybe they think I'm going to be one as well. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And it's like, nah, nah. Like you said, if if you're looking at a 20% on average um, victims that become in turn, um, it's... No, it's and that's so, I mean, if you pull a random sample of society, uh, it's it's about equal with any random sample that you take of society. So it's not, you know, it's not that people are becoming, uh, you know, I hate this phrase, but, you know, it's not that they're becoming damaged goods because they've been abused uh, and they start abusing. It's that, uh, it, it, you know, it's really the polar opposite. Um, in yeah. fact, uh I have not met a single survivor of, of abuse, and I've spoken to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds over the last eight years. I have not met a single survivor of child sexual abuse who's come back and said, I really struggle with um, with urges to abuse other kids. It's the polar opposite. Yeah. They will yeah. lay down on the railroad tracks to spare a child from yes. from from experiencing what they experienced as a child. The thoughts there, um, the thought constantly niggles at you because that's what society says. You were abused, so you're going to abuse. And, you know, living with that, I lived with that for years. You know, that constant, am I abused? Am I going to be an abuser? You know, it's like, oh, uh, uh, am I, shouldn't, uh, and you do, you start to walk around and, and you put up these walls. And, and your life becomes smaller and smaller and smaller, and um, you eventually just don't want to tell anybody. I didn't. I didn't want to tell anybody, but when, when I heard Carrie's testimony, it stirred something in me, you know? Um, it really did. But That's... after that Baptist church scene, mate, that was when I went helter-skelter. That was when um, you look back, if you could look back over my life, you'd say, wow, what happened to Eric at this stage in his life? that he went so nuts. You know, I almost chucked a teacher out of a window. Um, I used to throw chairs at teachers. I had, I had no fear. I was, I was just acting out constantly. And I, I did that for the next six years of my life, I think, after that and after I got kicked out of that church. I really went and lived like devil himself. Yeah. You know, it yeah. was um, – I had no – you know, I, I had, had no um, – thought for myself i really didn't like myself i i started to feel like i was being treated i was i was feeling like the trash that i was treated by these people as i became their victims yeah and um i told you I, i've told you before I, I got suicidal in that time um i twice tried to kill myself uh, the first time was with pills and man i just woke up hung over feeling like crap and didn't do that again <laughs> it, was like, it wasn't even an enjoyable night on the bottle you know it's like whoa i woke up with a head like a brick and um the next time it happened it was about oh i can vaguely remember july june july 1989 i um was home alone and I tried to smash my head against a fridge to kill myself and again I woke up with another bloody headache and didn't do that again because it didn't work. Mm-hmm. Um, but I caught the image. I th- I, you know, you do this stuff and I don't know what it is but sometimes when you, you see people that, um, what do they call them, cutters, self-harmers? Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. There's a reason for that. Um, they're trying to kill the pain and yes. physical pain will numb any emotional pain. I don't care what people say about drugs, booze, whatever. Nah, physical pain. Get a cigarette and burn it on your arm when you're feeling like crap. It kind of takes away that feeling like crap feeling and you feel like you're getting burnt instead. I've well, done this it. Is, I mean, this is what I talk about too with um, churches really don't know how to distinguish abusers from the rest of us. And so they just blend everybody together and actually they give uh, they give prominence to abusers because – they're quote unquote the really troubled people who need the grace of Jesus, and I'm like, no. See, the the, the key difference is people who've been abused, they uh, they inflict harm on themselves. It's yep. it's it's the self infliction because they feel like pieces of crap, and so 
they they harm themselves. They do bodily harm or they overeat or they undereat or they throw up their food that they did eat or they take to drugs or they're sexually pro, uh, promiscuous or or they abstain from sex or you know they do all these things that that hurt themselves where abusers all they do is they do things that inflict harm on others. That's the big they, difference. They hurt isn't... other people. Yep. And they enjoy it. They do. They're, they're um, what do they call them? They're like masochists. They they enjoy inflicting harm on others. Yeah. Is that masochists or sad, yeah, sad, yeah. sad? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Masochism. And that's what they do. Um, yeah, it's it's really sad. Or sadism. So, yeah, sadists are the sadism. ones that, yeah, they inflict harm on others. Yeah. And um, so that, that period of, of about six years there, till I was 22, I just went nuts. Um, I've got a few notes here. I'm just, yeah, I lived like the devil himself. I became a toy boy to older women. Um, I never got money, but I tell you much that I never lacked for food, clothes or bills. So I was pretty much a whore, you might as well say as well. Um, didn't matter. I didn't care. I drank like a fish. Uh, I snorted speed like I was possessed, um, and I was dealing a lot of drugs too and handing out, hanging out with some real nasty people, hmm. um, real nasty. And it was because they showed me brotherhood. It was bikies, and um, those guys were showing me what I was looking for. I was looking for family. You know, I was looking for community, and guess what? They got it. The church didn't have it for me at that stage, and these guys did. I wish every church leader could listen to this and actually, and actually have it resonate with them. Yeah, some aren't listening, sadly, mate. They're no. building their own little empires. You know, it's yeah. not about us. Uh. Uh-uh. I didn't come. I didn't come out because I did it for me. I'd prefer to shut up and not say another word for the rest of my life. But God would not let me sit still. You know. Um, yeah. This is not something you do for fun, and that's what really pisses me off when you see people putting others down that have come out and spoken out, and they start putting them down. It's like they got no idea yeah. how much that damages them more than the abuse itself because they've gotten over the abuse. They've come forward to speak out, and then bang, they cop it again. You're lying. You're not worth it. You're telling stories. Mate, yeah. that's dangerous. Yeah. I really get Thank you with that stuff. And so, like, I lived like like crazy, mate. Um, I lost my um, conscience. Um, back then, I wouldn't have had a trouble slitting somebody's throat. Um, it's just the way that I lived. I was running a lot of drugs. Um, and that kind of slowed down and stopped when my mum, my mum found eight kilos of weed in my cupboard once and... Um, Never said a word, but I just saw the look on her face and it kind of impacted me more than anything because I grew up in a family where there was a lot of yelling and screaming and drinking. And, um, yeah, mum just never said a word and so that was it. I stopped after that and that's when things started to change. That was early 1989. And, um, yeah, I got invited to a church again. After all this time, it seems like, you know, I keep getting dragged back to church. Yeah. Uh, I, I have to ask sometimes, too, whether it was God or the devil dragging me back to a church because mm. these churches, they were not the churches of God. Um, they may have changed since then, and I pray they have, but my experience was when I was going through these churches, they were as far from Christ as you'd ever think. Mm. You know, so I... Went to this church um, the first night I went there, mate. I was smashed, eh? I downed a whole heap of hash that night. I was off my face. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, I still remember that the lady came to pick me up and she just looked at me. She says, You're not going like that. Ours. I put my sonnies on. I said, Is that better? And I said, I ain't changing for no son of a biscuit, you know. <laughs> This is what you get. <laughs> she, she, she took me anyway. She's a brave girl. <laughs> it was interesting because it, it was a a, a, um, a Pentecostal church, and I ruined the 
worship because it was about the second song. The guy, the pastor at the time, he looks at me and goes, is there something I can help you with? I, I just, my hands went up and I said, man, I'm a mess. I need Jesus. <laughs> um, that was it. It was like everybody's looking at me and I was freaking out. I just wanted to get out of there, mate, because they were doing, you know, praying in tongues and, and doing stuff that I'd not seen, you know. You don't see that kind of stuff in most churches. And so, yeah, over the period of the next four to five months, I don't remember much of what happened because, like I said, I was drinking a lot and doing a lot of drugs and that all became non-existent. So I was doing weird stuff. Um, I thought I was Jesus for about two weeks. That was the best one. Um, <laughs> Uh, and I feel like I feel like oh, we wow. needed we needed the old Eric in our church just to spice things up a little wow. bit. Wow. Uh, hey, listen, if me and Roxanne ever get together with those dolls, mate, we're going to have a ball. <laughs> Roxanne loves you, by the way, and she's never met you. I can't wait to let her listen to this cool. podcast. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. You know, but like that that church, um, I was a wreck, mate, oh. and. I eventually put myself into the mission home because I couldn't let my parents see me going through it. I was going through it. I was just whacked. I had security remove me from a hospital because I was trying to raise patients that were crook, you know. Um, I was doing weird stuff. I tried to raise a cat from the dead. And it, was, <laughs> it was just a whole lot of weird stuff happening. So I thought best my parents don't get to see this because they I was weird enough as it was. And... um yeah, that was when it all went to hell again. Um, the guy that was running the the um, mission home at the time had not long been out of a <clears throat> homosexual relationship and gotten saved. And so he's running a mission home for young fellas, street kids, young boys. And needless to say, over the period of time that I was there, that um, I, I remember at different stages that he would massage me um, in different spots you'd call personal. Um, but he assured me that it was because of the uh, withdrawals I was going through that, um, you know, I was constipated and sometimes a massage in the old empty space, hmm. I call it. You know, I don't know what it's called. Behind your testicles, between your bum, whatever that is. But <laughs> we we had a nickname in it. We had a nickname for it in college, but I probably shouldn't say it on the air. Okay. Thank you, Jimmy. Uh, thank you, Clara, for being present. And keeping oh him boy, <laughs> she she's over here gesturing at me like <laughs> oh, <laughs> like I'm going to be in the doghouse if I if I say this say name. Say no more. Yes. <laughs> he he massaged me around my stomach to help me and all that sort of stuff. And then one night he asked me to come into his room, man, and I walked in there and the bloke's stark naked on the floor and he was ready for action. Um, he was already excited, didn't need me in the room. He was running the show on his own. And um, I freaked. Um, that was when it was flight or fight. And I thought if I kill him, I'll only go to jail. Mm -hmm. So I took off. Um, I left that. And then in between, you know, things had happened. I moved from that church to another church, same denomination, and um, eventually, you know, started planting churches with another pastor from there. And he married me and my first wife. And years later... It was only oh, it was a couple of years back. I could go back through my rego details because I remember the car that I owned at the time. I drove up there. It's about an hour and a half, two hours from here, and told him what had happened because he'd moved back up this way. And usual tears. He listened to me. He prayed for me afterwards, and I felt quite sort of clean. I felt really, really fresh. And he followed it up and apparently rang the fella and talked to him. And the next phone call I got off him, it was pretty much, well, I've spoken to the gentleman and, you know, he's denied it and I'm pretty happy with that. Hmm. Wow. And my jaw just fell to the floor because I'd spent years with this guy, you know, in his house. Prayers. I, I watched his kids grow up. You know, I know, I know things about his kids that he don't even know and got no idea what's going on. And you know what? He failed to report it to the police. 
Hmm. Mm. Um, I don't know why pastors haven't got the balls just to report it to the police, whether it's true or not. You know? You, you know what I found, and, and this was just from my position as a pastor myself, and, uh, you know, and, you know, mom and I, as soon as we found out, uh, we were in the police station reporting my dad. Um, yep. And it sucked. You know, it was something that was absolutely devastating to us, but we saw no other option before us. Uh, we had to report because it was, yep. it was the right thing to do. And so, you know, I, I often ask that question, what is it about people who it, it makes them become so protective of people who bear the name Christian, who are terrorizing these little children and, and young adults and uh, even adults, you know, what is it that makes them so protective? And I really think it boils down to when you're in ministry and, and you're just engrossed in ministry, um, you slowly develop a complex without realizing that you're developing it, where you almost uh, you almost become delusional like what you were when you were all hopped up on drugs. You feel yeah. like you're the savior almost, you know? Like, man, the, the, the more screwed up somebody's life is or the more sinful they are, if if we can just connect them and and get them to transform immediately because we're addicted to these immediate conversions that's why victims yep. are told hurry up and and move on get over your bitterness forgive and move on you know you're screwing <laughs> up you're screwing up my mojo as a pastor and you're making next the church time, look bad next um, time pastor says that to me man i'm going to slap him up the back of the head yeah it's, it's awful that, man i yeah that you might as well stab somebody in the guts you know, that's what that kind of stuff does. And this is yeah. what I don't understand either, Jimmy. What the hell is Brian Houston hiding? It's a good question. Why is he so scared just to come clean and deal with that issue? We've got a big, big focus. I don't know if you've noticed here in Australia at the moment, um, Phil Pringle's under the gun. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Brian Houston's trying to put a blanket over all um, social media and he's looking at legal action and the newspapers in Australia have actually backed off reporting about Hillsong at the moment because, you know, who's got money like that? You know, it's what's interesting is when I wrote uh, my blog post uh, back last year about Brian Houston, yep. um, of course, he got a jab. He had to get a jab in about me. Um and I and I really didn't write that to trash Brian Houston. I just was like, dude, what's what's going on? Like, what in the world are you thinking? Um, and I was just kind of thinking through that. Well, he got his jab in, and and somebody else who I'm really close to, uh, he had read my article, and he said, "Did you uh, did you get threatened with a lawsuit yet?" And I said, <laughs> "I said no." He's like, oh, "I did." He's like, "I wrote a post about Brian Houston," and he said it wasn't 24 hours later. I was served with papers that he was he yeah. was threatening to sue me. That's what he does. Yep. And I saw, well, you know, he had trashed the media back when 60 Minutes did that story uh, about Brett. Um, you know, when Brett came oh, forward that's... and spoke to 60 Minutes. And, yeah. uh, you know, of course, uh, Hillsong put their statements out and they put it up on their website and they, they were doing damage control, but they were threatening lawsuits then. Look at what they did to... Another friend of mine, Tanya Levine, who wrote that book, People in Glass Houses. They gave her hell. They they, they spread rumors that the poor girl was a witch and all this kind of stuff just wow. to discredit her. So they wouldn't, people wouldn't believe the stuff that she'd brought out in her book. And it was true. You yeah. Know? Yeah. What, what have we got to hide? When were the, when, where were the days gone? You're a pastor now where churches were, um, what's it called? Transparent, you know. Um, yeah. Well, why is everything hidden now? You know, meetings are held behind closed doors. Things are often spoken about that nobody else gets to hear, and it's like, what? I saw that happen. You know, in the in the last church that I was in, 
before I was also asked to leave recently. <laughs> Seems like I'm, wow. I'm sensing a pattern here, Eric. <laughs> oh, this one's a ripper, mate. I don't have a problem talking about this one. This one's fresh. Oh, oh what do they say? Was it wounds heal and but scars remain? Well, this mm-hmm. scar's still red. <laughs> <laughs> um, after all this, I think I've had enough, you know, me and the missus. I worked... In Melbourne till about 2005, I worked uh, for Main Health at corporate there. I was a bit of a suit wearer and, and a tie fella, you know, all all fancy schmancy, rubbing shoulders with the boys. <laughs> and um, I burned out doing that, and we moved up here just to get away from it. All moved bush, and um, I was at a lovely little church. Everything was going great. Then things started to happen, and you know, I just noticed this particular fella was handing out rubbish in the church. And I thought, hang on, what's going on here? I was the sound guy, so at the back of the church, mate, I had the best view. <laughs> I'm going, there were all, all these heavenly tourism books. You know, these, I went to heaven, crap. All the malarkey, malarkey. Wasn't malarkey one of the guys that wrote it? Um, <laughs> yeah, you're hearing me. Uh-huh. Um, <laughs> So I have a chat to the guy and I said, listen, mate, I don't mean to be rude, but this is a Presbyterian church and I really don't think that kind of material is appreciated. You know, could you not do it? Well, two weeks later I found him doing it again. So I told him this time that it's not appreciated and if I catch him again, I'll drag him out by the scruff of his neck and talk to the (laughs) elders with him outside. So nothing happened. Everything was quite two weeks later. I catch him and his missus laying hands on some visiting missionaries, and I swear they were praying in tongues. And I've gone, oh, I just can't deal with this. And I went up and had a yak to him afterwards and um, had a chat to the pastor at the time who thought I had the ear off, and it all fell on dead ears. This fella um, sends an anonymous email to the church saying that Eric Pedersen was showing possible grooming behaviour towards children. Wow. Whoa. And so all of a sudden, right, I've just, I've just gone, mm. this is a new thing for me, you know. Um, it all started over the fact that there was a young couple who had two kids in the church and we were kind of like, I don't know, I felt like, a grandparent to their kids because, you know, crikey, there's like 50 years difference. And this one little snotter, Annabelle was her name. She was a great kid, but, man, she couldn't eat. She couldn't get food in her mouth. She'd have to put it all over her face. <laughs> so when she ate, ate a Tim Tam, you know what a Tim Tam is, right? I don't think. No. Oh, that's it. Me and Linda will send you some Tim Tams. We'll sort that out. Well, the chocolate biscuit. <laughs> I can't like, wait. It's like. A chocolate, it's heaven in a chocolate biscuit. It's just amazing. And it actually sounds all, amazing. She'd just have them all over her face. She'd come to me in the kitchen and just put her hands up and look at me and, and you know, do a, a cat. You know how they do the pat, pat, oh, what is it? Pout their lips. She wanted mm-hmm. me to wash her face and her hands, so I'd do it. Well, that was what they wanted. And so mm-hmm. this guy used that, reported me for showing grooming behavior, and within Two, three weeks, mate, I was under church discipline. Um, the elders had a meeting with me, which was an absolute joke. I've got it. I wrote a blog about it, actually. It's it's all up on a blog that I wrote. And in the short, um, I cut the meeting off because they would not show me the letter, right? I said to them, if you show me the proof, I'll submit to any disciplinary action you need to take. I said, but I want to see that letter. Yeah. I said, because you guys know very well in three weeks, I'm going to blow the whistle on you because you have been doing dodgy stuff with money. They'd been lying to the congregation. And this was just so convenient that they used it to get rid of me because mm-hmm. when you're under discipline in the Presbyterian church, you communicated, you, your communicate status is removed. Hmm. So anything mm-hmm. I table is irrelevant anyway, right? And these guys are as Dodgy as a truck stop dim sim, mate. They are bad. They are off. They take me through. I get kicked out of the church. I get a letter. And um, I thought, I'll find out who this is. Didn't take me long. 
the gentleman moved to another church and then proceeded to try the same thing on another elder and his wife and actually said to them, praise God, with a witness, that if you guys don't leave the church, I'm going to have to do to you what I did to Eric. Hmm. Now, I've told Hmm. these guys at the Presbyterian Church, I, Hmm. I told them years ago who the perpetrator was, they never looked into it. They never follow it up because they're going to have to come clean for all the dodgy stuff they did. And um, it was interesting. I ran into one of the church leaders the other day after two years. There he was sitting behind his little rotary stand doing his thing for charity. And he was silly enough to ask me how I was. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, 15, 20 minutes later. Oh, boy. Um, I wasn't rude. I wasn't rude. But considering that this gentleman is an officer of the law, I reminded him that accused of grooming, you guys have given me almost three years free reign still in the community for not reporting it to the police. I went to the police the next day and mm-hmm. said, is there any reports about me being accused of grooming? I said, that is sure. awesome. Wow. That is actually wow. really brilliant. Wow. Why not? You know, they've got to yeah. write it down. And so... Because um, you had it in writing mm-hmm. that they were accusing you of mm-hmm. being a predator. Yeah. Yeah. That's it, awesome. Wow. So but, what came what came of that? Um, Nothing. <laughs> they, they don't care. Like, That's a shame. I, they should have they they gotten charges pressed against them. Um, I haven't finished with them. <laughs> I've got to deal with that Royal Commission stuff first, but I will take it up because that fellow that sat there yeah, he's a police officer, a leader in the church, and what's worse, he's the police liaison officer for the schools. Hmm. Yeah. Wow. And I said to him, I said, as a copper, I said, as a copper, you should hang your bloody head in shame for the fact that you've given me three years free reign to all the schools in the community. I still have my working with children check, right? I still have my scripture religious education ticket, I can walk in and out of any school I want. And if I'm a predator, those guys in their failure to report me, oh, mate, what damage could I have caused if I was? You are brilliant. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, really? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But seriously, you know what? I haven't spoken to many people about this, Jimmy. You know the real kicker? This is the thing that gets me from – because the selfish people like that, being called a groomer, or or showing grooming behaviour towards children in a country town where incest and rape is endemic. Mm -hmm. I was a leader in the youth in the church. I ran the teen boys youth club at the yearly Bible um, club that they ran every year, right? Yeah. Yet they still just chose to do that and not report me to the police. Mm. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it, it was horrid. I, I, mm-hmm. I won't take it sitting down. I know it was a power play because I busted a moderator that had gone to Sydney when we should have switched from a charge to a, a home mission because we couldn't afford a pastor. These guys didn't do it, and they employed a pastor behind the church's back. We'd been paying him for months, huh. you know, and and I was going to call them out on that and amongst other things because I was on the um, committee of management, the business council. So I had to sit and listen to these whinge and old bags and blokes most of the time, whinge and whine and carry on. I had them erupt at me once. One guy looked like he was going to take my head off because I told him that the work he did on the church was crap, and it was, <laughs> you know. Seriously, just simple stuff like that. When you have people erupt in rage, you know there's a bigger issue, Jimmy, eh? Oh, yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah. And, and and these guys won't look me in the face. I've got no time for them. One of the elders who had his three kids in that church and two of them were in the youth group with me, he sat across the table and I asked him point blank. I said, listen, mate, I shouldn't say his name's David Carroll, but that's it. Um <laughs> Did I say David Carroll? <laughs> looked at him we'll, in the we'll eyes. Forget the, said, we'll forget to edit out David yeah. Carroll probably because yeah. I'm busy. Ah, oh, it happens, you know. Oh, Whoops. Wow. Um, I looked him in the eye and said to him, do you believe I'm grooming children in this church? And he says, no, I don't. But he's still accusing me of grooming children. Hmm. Lack of integrity, mate. Total lack of integrity. Yeah. You know? Yeah. That that, that. And so – I've tasted of a whole lot of yuck um, from both ends 
in the spectrum of church and I'm going to fight now. I've had enough. Yeah. Um, Good. I'm not going to be quiet anymore. I'm 52. Um, I told my mother I'd be nice until she passed away and she's passed away now. And so the gloves are off. I've got nothing to lose. If Brian wants to sue me because I think he's a dirtbag too, he can have half my bills. I'd be glad to get rid of them. <laughs> you know? Um, yeah. It, it's it's not right and it's not fair, Jimmy, that people in the church get treated like this. And um, these goons, I agree. they're goons. They're running huge industries with mega Brands. That's all they are. They're no different to Gucci or or, or um, all them other Lagerfeld or whatever you want to call them. They're just a brand. Hillsong's a brand. Mm-hmm. Um, the, mm-hmm. the people are nothing to them. Brian's shutting down the media here in Australia trying to bloody gag them because he wants to protect his brand. Yeah. That's all it is. Yeah. You know? Yeah, AOG, absolutely. He renamed the AOG to the Australian – Christian churches, after Frank's indiscretions, he calls it, came out. His old man was a stinking pedophile, and he hit it. Then he goes to Hillsong, and now he's in Hillsong International. The last thing he needs is a stain on that brand, and he'll do anything. He's got the money. Oh, yeah. You know? Yeah, that For is a big machine. Oh, dude. Very what, big machine. You, you watched it. What did they call it? Um, the Dinner Gate. When Brian got snubbed by the White House for dinner, yeah, uh, yeah, is Scott Morrison that stupid that he wouldn't think that um, maybe the American guys might look into the background of people he was inviting, right. and they would have straight up gone, um, Brian was censored at the Royal Commission. It's been recommended that he be charged with hiding his father's pedophilia. Uh, no, we don't want him eating in the White House. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I know. I don't get it. I don't get it. It's 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 one of those things. Brett, you know, cabin stock. You spoke of him. Yeah. You know what's Brian doing? How how hard is it to say um, and come clean? Well, and I just look too, because because Brett, you know, Brett has uh, he's incurred all this all this debt from having cancer. Yep. And here the guy's laid up with a with a GoFundMe. And I think he has something like seven hundred dollars um, to his name through the GoFundMe, and yeah. somebody, whoever created the GoFundMe, said something like, "You know, Hillsong has uh, plenty of money that they could they could donate to Brett." And uh, quite frankly, uh, if I saw any one of my dad's victims who are suffering, uh, I would go out of my way and I'd I'd start selling possessions to pay for their treatments, yeah. whether it's counseling yeah. or 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 you know other health issues that they had. Uh, I would happily do that because Absolutely. I feel like I owe them I owe them an incredible debt because of what my father did to them. And I know that's yeah. I, I know it's not my responsibility. I get that. That's not what I'm saying. But you feel this connection and this burden for for the hell Absolutely. that they're living. Yeah. And it's not like you own what your father did and you're not trying to make um, recompense for it. You just out of you, – you, you just can't not be kind to people like that, eh? Yeah, right. You, I, I don't get it. It's the same with Kerry, um, Kerry Ferguson, all that hoo-ha we had recently on A Current Affair for the last two nights here in Sydney. Um, she was treated like crap. Um, and – I'll be crying that one from the rooftops, mate. When a lady in the church can get beaten up by her husband and the pastor and another elder in the church can watch it on multiple times and not say anything about it, me and Gary Dench are going to have words. Um, That is an atrocious, atrocious behavior for a pastor to do that. And then she goes to him for help when she finds out her husband has been raping her stepson. And does nothing. She goes to Phil Pringle, does nothing, reaches out to Brian Houston, does nothing. This is what it's like. Yeah. You know, those people yeah. shouldn't be in ministry. They're not Christians. They're not pastors. That's that's just – I'd walk away. Yeah. You know, I seriously, if, if Brian Houston had had any character, he would have walked away from the ministry when it, when it all blew up that, that him and all those other goons were hiding it. 
Mm-hmm. You know, that's the thing, mate. I think it's accountability. You've seen that in the um, Southern Baptist over there. Yeah. Where these people make their own rules and they're accountable to no one. Mate, they can get away with anything. Well, and then they then they uh, put the lipstick on and they say, "Well, we're you know we're just so broken over all the you know the Houston Chronicle report that came out and all this stuff. We're so broken over this." And I'm like, no, "That's not how this works. Like, mm-hmm. your your words mean nothing if if you're not taking swift action to correct it." Absolutely. Well, you saw the minutes, like not harping on about Brian, but you saw those minutes that I sent through to you, mm-hmm. yeah, where um. He had a board that he was accountable to when that came out in 99 about his father. Now, every bloke whose name's on that piece of paper that sided with Brian and chose to hide it and do everything behind closed doors should be made accountable for just as much as Brian is. The whole bunch of them. I agree. You know, um, if it was, well, if it was a business, the CEO... Mate, he's the one that's got to go. He's accountable. Mm-hmm. You know, I just don't get it. The accountability is is totally lacking, you know, and, and that's something that I read up today when I was just looking into the background of churches that um, was it the Australian Baptists. They want autonomy. They, they still want to be Baptists and under the Baptist banner, but they want complete autonomy from the community and other um, churches within their own denominations. That in itself is a law unto yourself. Sure is. You know, like yeah. you're a non-denominational church. I bet you you are accountable to other people that aren't just in your church, are you? Like, you know what I mean? Like yeah. you well, yourself, you have elders and pastors that aren't just monkeys from other places that are real blokes that you're accountable for what you do. Well, one of the one of the unique things about us is our churches are we claim autonomy, so each individual congregation is autonomous, and mm-hmm. uh, you know that that becomes problematic, and and uh, you know when when you try to have accountability, um, your accountability extends as far as your your own local congregation. Yep. Um, but you know the other side of that is look at the SBC who. You know they govern all of their congregations, and there's no accountability there. So I don't know which. I don't know if one is any any more accountable than the other. Uh, both are incredibly broken systems. And uh, it, do you it's, think it could look back if you if you go back it it could come back to the basic principles that most of these people are dogs and have no fear of God and shouldn't be in the church to start with. I think a lot of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a lot of them. Absolutely. <laughs> I I got what twelve churches here in this valley, and though some aren't what you'd call Orthodox Christian, they display more Christian behaviour than those that say they are Christian. Go figure. I know. You know. It's like where do you where do you get the balance? Where do we have a place that's safe and secure, where people are accountable and victims? can get the sanctuary they need. That's the thing that they need. Yes. It, it takes And it takes years to get over this stuff. People like me are messy. That's it. Yep. We're messy. Yeah. 1-800, get over it. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Well, that's, that's the big problem we're facing right now. I mean, you know, I'll close on this note because I got to go pick up kids yes. and uh you'll be stuck talking to mom no, she hasn't, mom she hasn't has, said a word mom though hasn't so. said, i i <laughs> i have questions so at some point maybe we can have we'll eric, have to have eric on again. for part two and i have i do have questions i'd like to ask Absolutely. eric starting yeah. from way yep. back when he was a kid introduced to porn yep. to when the ladies in the church were uh, grooming him and molesting him to his erratic behavior, I have a lot of questions that I'd like to ask Eric. So maybe we could have a part two. At some well, I'll point. leave. I mean, I'll leave us on this high note because I think uh, one of the things that really encourages me about you, Eric, is um, beyond your sarcasm that I just get. <laughs> um, you, you have not. You like so many other survivors have not lost your faith in God, and um, 
the church has burned you over and over and over again. And what I'm seeing survivors do, and I'm super encouraged by it, is rather than just just roll over and let the church steamroll them, you guys are standing up and saying enough. Um, We're going to fight so that the church uh, can be a safe place, so that it can be the sanctuary that it's supposed to be for people who are oppressed and abused. And, uh, you know, I think... I think you guys have uh, – survivors especially have so much power to affect change, and uh, there are a lot of people that are uh, – they're nervous right now, and uh, I think yeah, that's a good thing. We need good pastors, mate, people like us. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we're seeing a lot Excuse of survivors. Me. Oh, mom's uh I'm sorry. She's about to fall over over no, here. No, <laughs> I have allergies. I'm sorry. Eric, well, it has been wonderful meeting pitch, you right. and I want to say the same thing. Your um faith is amazing. You have not let people destroy it. And <clears throat> I like what you said that God keeps calling you back to him. And I think that um that's what it is. We rise above the dirt the dirty stuff, and we connect with God, and and we will create that sanctuary that is so needed. Absolutely. Well, the next, well, next episode we talk about, I'll tell you um, when I got saved in amongst all that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, in the that, meantime, man, we're we're going to keep linking arms, and uh, I'm just proud to oh, be fighting yeah. this fight with you, and I just appreciate Thank all you. that you're doing, um, and you're making I a difference. Yeah. You and your mum too, mate. You guys are an inspiration. Um, you guys give us folks that are victims um, the ear that we need. You see, it only starts start with one or two ears, mm-hmm. and all of a sudden you've got a whole lot of people talking. Yeah, True. absolutely, all, absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Well, it's an honour. Don't miss the kids, man. Yeah, you're getting. Tr- <laughs> It'll cost you some lollies for ice cream. That's right. <laughs> how many? How many have you got? Uh, three. Oh, not as bigger breeder as your mother no <laughs> no Gosh. what about oscar sorry i had a guy on the podcast the other week oscar he's got nine kids <laughs> no. That's a well lot. clara has 11 yes. so i mean <laughs> you are okay it's official guys this is on the jimmy hinton podcast clara <laughs> is a bloody legend <laughs> she is a bloody legend <laughs> Straight to the pool room with that photo, mate. <laughs> you'll, I'll tell you about that next time. You'll understand. But thank you for having me on, eh? Thank you for I coming on, bro. Thank you. I get to sleep now. It's only 4.30 in the morning. Oh, there wow. you go. Get some sleep. And uh, <laughs> yeah. and for our listeners, yeah. yep, Did for our listeners, and up? until next time, uh, thank you yeah, for thank tuning you. in. Bless you, guys. Thanks again for listening to today's episode of the Speaking Out on Sex Abuse podcast. Thank you to our patrons who make this podcast possible. If you found it helpful, please follow on Spreaker, subscribe on Google Play Music, Apple Podcast, or Stitcher. If you believe in what we do, consider supporting the podcast by becoming a patron and check out the cool rewards our patrons receive. Share with your friends and tell the world. Join us in speaking out on sex abuse so we can change the tides and prevent abuse.